A uh, very good evening, friends. I'm very happy to be back with you all here today. And at the outset, I want to wish you all uh, happy Navaratri, and also very happy Vijay Dasmi. So this is a time for us to pick up new knowledge, and this is the right time for learning. So with that in mind, today's focus would be what are the new skills that we need to pick up uh, if you want to um, enter the automotive industry and make an impact in this space? What are those skills that will be very important for us? That's the plan for the discussion today. Just allow me to share my screen in a minute. Okay. I hope you are able to see my screen. Um, the topic for discussion today is uh, future skills for mobility engineers. So when I say mobility engineers, it's basically you and me, how we are going to prepare ourselves for the future of the automotive industry. So this is uh, part of a series of talk under the team of Mobility Engineer 2030, a series uh, from the Mahindra Technology Leadership and uh, this is being hosted by NPTEL. And uh, some of you might have attended a few other talks in the series. The first one was on the future of mobility, which gave a technology overview of various new technologies uh, which are shaping up the future mobility space. And the second talk was on uh, multidisciplinary design optimization in automotive engineering. And the third was data science in automotive product design. This was a talk we had last week. And today, this is a fourth talk in the series, uh, which is titled Future Skills for Mobility Engineers. So my name is uh, Shankar. So I'm a vice president uh, for uh, uh, technology innovation and knowledge management. And I'm also the dean for the Mahindra Technical Academy. And uh, we are based at the Mahindra Research Valley here in Chennai. And uh, prior to joining Mahindra, I had uh, held uh, technology leadership roles at Cummins, Honeywell, Dow Chemicals, General Electric, and the Indian Space Research Organization. This is my uh, brief uh, work experience background. In terms of uh, education background, I have a PhD in uh, materials from the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, and I studied physics prior to that. I also did my management education from the Indian Institute of Science, Management, Bangalore. So this is my education background. And I've been a very active inventor with a few patents and also a few patent applications in the pipeline. And uh, I like uh, speaking on technology innovation related topics. So I really look forward to this interaction with you all today. This is just a summary of the talk and uh, we will get into the core of the talk. And um, a lot of what I'm going to share with you today, you can find uh, in a regular column that I write in the Society of Automotive Engineers, SAE, their quarterly magazine called the Mobility Engineering. I write a regular column here called the Mobility Engineer 2030, where we talk about what are those future skills that we would all need to do well in the automotive industry of the future. So typically when I get to interact with the students and faculty members, the kind of questions that come up are typically what I have listed here. It starts with a very fundamental question, what is the future of mobility? And what exactly are those technologies that are shaping the future mobility products? In terms of a response to this question, we covered a quite a bit of it, the very first talk in the series, which is the future mobility technologies overview that I gave. And for those of you who had missed the talk, maybe you could go back and look at that video where we have covered electric, autonomous, connected, and shared vehicle technologies. The second set of questions that I typically hear is uh, how will the future jobs be like in the automotive industry? What new skills do I need to acquire to become industry ready? And more importantly, how can I learn these new skills very quickly? This uh, learning this Skills quickly is important because all these technologies are evolving so fast that we have very limited time to pick up these technologies. Otherwise, we may get lost, so we have to do it very fast. And uh, finally, a set of um, two more questions, which are typically a little more deeper. What competencies 
to automotive OEMs look for when they hire fresh engineers because I find a lot of the young engineers very eager to get into the automotive industry space. So they are keen to know what is it that we look for when we hire fresh engineers. So that is definitely one uh, question that I get very often. And finally, what career growth opportunity does the automotive industry offer for young engineers? Is it better than what other industries like IT industry can offer? So this is also in terms of once you get into the industry, how is your growth like? How fast you can grow? How far can you grow? What do they look for when they look for those candidates with high potential for growth? What exactly do we look for? So these are the typical uh, questions that I get to hear whenever I interact with uh, young engineers from the various uh, institutes, universities across India. On a few occasions when I had interacted with students outside India, the questions were not very different. They were very, very similar to this because if you look at the automotive industry across the globe, they're going through very, very similar disruptions. So the concerns and the questions are very, very similar, whichever part of the globe you go and talk to. So I'll try to answer most of these questions and the discussion that we have today. So when we look at uh, future skills for mobility engineers, I have grouped them into two sets. One is domain skills, the other is cognitive skills. So I will spend the first few minutes talking about the domain skills, and then I will move on to the next important area of cognitive skills. This is a plan for the day. Uh, for the discussion on the domain skills, I would encourage you to read this um, white paper that SAE Fisita brought out. Um, this is a very, very uh, thorough research that uh, SAE Fisita had done, talking to people from industry, academia across the globe to understand what are the future requirements and what kind of future skills are needed for mobility engineers. Uh, this is a very well-researched and a well-written uh, white paper. I would encourage all of you to read this paper if you want to know how exactly the, what are exactly are the forces that are shaping the future of mobility and what are those skills that will become very important for the future. My own research in this area started with reading this particular paper. So I would uh, extensively quote this paper during the first half of the presentation, which is about the domain skills. So if you look at how the automotive industry is being uh, reshaped, there are three big forces that are shaping the automotive industry. That's what uh, we can see here at the three corners of the triangle. One is the connectivity revolution. The second is the intelligence revolution. And the third is the energy revolution. When I say revolution, it's a fairly big shift in terms of new technologies coming in the performance of these technologies and the value that they can create for the customers. I'm sure all of you are very well aware and you have all been great beneficiaries of the connectivity revolution, which is all about uh, smart devices and staying connected across and the power that connectivity can bring in and the value proposition that it brings in. Intelligence revolution, I'm sure to an extent you have been exposed to in terms of various algorithms and uh, programs and the various uh, devices that use the power of artificial intelligence and machine learning to do useful work for you. This again cuts across multiple domains, but we will specifically talk about the automotive domain today. And finally, the energy revolution is about clean energy, the renewables, the solar, the wind, so on, and the impact that the clean energy has on the automotive space. So these three, each by itself is a fairly big thing. And today we see all these three coming together. Three very powerful, very strong forces, energy, connectivity, and intelligence coming together and working together to reshape the automotive industry. So it's very important for us to appreciate the fact that automotive is at the interface of these three industries, which each one of which is very big by itself, energy, connectivity and intelligence. If you see what kind of impact this has made so far, look at the six blocks, three on the left and three on the right that I've shown here. If you look at the changes, 
the information was in silos in the past and because of the connectivity it's all connected so the car is being looked as a intelligent terminal rather than the isolated piece same day in the past we used to have the humans driving the vehicle in the future we are talking about a completely autonomous driving system and the car was looked as something that to spends energy so it was looked at as, as a energy dissipation machine but today we are able to think of a future where the car will be a source of energy and also it is a mobile source of energy so these are some of the shifts that are happened because of the three forces energy connectivity and intelligence the way they are coming together and shaping the future space look at the right side here there are again three more blocks that i have shown here one is we used to talk about owning the vehicle in the past and today we are talking about a shared vehicle so you can have access to the vehicle on a need basis so sharing has become as convenient in fact more economical than owning a vehicle second is even the manufacturing the way the vehicles are being made from the traditional automotive manufacturing is now moving into intelligent manufacturing we talk about industry 4.0 the power of digital manufacturing whole manufacturing space is getting connected and is becoming intelligent now also the car which was looked at as just a tool for moving from point a to point b is looked at more as a transportation service a end to end model and there are so many things built around this car we'll spend a few more minutes to understand this entire ecosystem before we get into the skills that we need to contribute to this when all this big changes are happening what is also important is there will be as a engineer working in the space you would see that a lot of new development methods would come in new manufacturing methods there will be new core technologies that will enable the product there will be new usage methods new even the maintenance methods will become new ones and there will also be new infrastructure for example electric vehicles we talk about the fast charging infrastructure and like there will be a need for a new infrastructure also so we are looking at not just new automotive products in the future we are looking at a new mobility ecosystem so what i mean by this ecosystem i will tell you very briefly what are the key elements of this ecosystem but before that i just wanted to spend a couple of minutes on the four disruptions that are actually changing the entire landscape of the automotive industry the very first one is uh, electric traction so this is not just about a electric car but the entire ecosystem which may include even non automotive infrastructure this includes renewable energies smart grids but this is important because end of the day say at 6 pm when you all come back home from office and then you are all going to connect your car to the grid for charging so we have to factor the source of energy the capacity of the grid to support multiple electric vehicles that are getting charged more or less at the same time a lot of things one need to factor in terms of the ecosystem around electric mobility so that's the first disruption second one is centered around the automated driving itself the entire robotization with high level of safety and security this would include artificial intelligence machine learning and even formal methods to provide the required level of safety the third disruption is around connected cars again we look at the ecosystem with uh, telecommunication technologies and business models this includes standardization of protocols bandwidth even cyber security a whole bunch of things that comes in this particular ecosystem of connected cars finally the fourth one is more of a business model which is mobility on demand here we talk about new services with partnership with public authorities for example with the city the entire city administration mobility becomes a key enabler then uh, access versus ownership new business models and new partnerships all this will contribute to this fourth disruption so there are four big disruptions that are changing this landscape of the mobility industry electric traction automated driving connected cars and mobility on demand 
So with this in mind, if you are looking at what are the attributes of a new next-gen mobility product, because if you are aspiring to become a mobility engineer, and if you specifically want to contribute to building, designing and building this next-gen mobility products, then you would see that it's going to be a mix of mechanics, electrics and electronics, software, and the device and its environment. All these four would become key attributes for the next-gen mobility product. So you need to have skills spread across all these four areas if you want to build a product that seamlessly cuts across all these domains. A mobility ecosystem, because it's not just about building a vehicle, it's about the entire ecosystem. Just take a minute to look at the various components of this ecosystem. Looking at autonomous driving, operating system, safety, fleet management, connectivity in the cloud, security, flow management, which is mobility as a service, end-to-end -end service, including the last mile connectivity, and then the fuels, the liquids and the gaseous fuels, then energy and charging stations. This is where the renewables and the charging station infra infrastructure of uh, charging stations, all this we will look at in the context of electric mobility. So we will look at even the physical infrastructure, the roads, the parking lots, a whole bunch of things, the road tools, payment system, parking management, even the insurance and the smart grid. All this would contribute towards the ecosystem, the mobility ecosystem of the future. So opportunity exists along across all these areas if you want to really make a difference that contribute to building this future mobility. So it's not just within the product, it's also across the entire ecosystem. So when all these big changes are happening, the kind of talent that the automotive industry wants to hire and bring into the workforce will also change. So here I have just listed three important points here. The first is the engineering landscape, the automotive industry will definitely broaden in scope. Because in the past, it was predominantly mechanical engineers. So now in addition to mechanical engineers, we'll comp automotive companies, the OEMs, will also look for uh, engineers from IT and various other new technology disciplines, which I'll elaborate on the charts ahead. More importantly, besides specialists, the industry will also require generalists with capability across different engineering disciplines that link the various engineering fields and engineering collaboration across multiple disciplines will become very critical for success. So if you are debating whether you want to be a specialist or a generalist, actually for the future mobility industry, you need to be both. You need to be a specialist and you also need to be a generalist. When I say specialist, it's about having in-depth knowledge in one or two domains which is very important. When I say generalist, it's about having a breadth of knowledge across multiple domains. That is also important. So now you are looking at how do you build this kind of a depth and breadth, you being both a specialist and generalist, because this is what is needed for the future. So I will also tell you how one can go about building both depth and breadth. The skill set of the engineer will expand from predominantly technical requirements to also other process related skills. So far we talked about only engineering skills. Now I'll just mention about a few process related skills beyond engineering. This will be such as uh, the agile project management, better communication skills, operating in virtual environments, and flexible organizations. All this will become very important for the success of engineers. So apart from engineering skills, you need these skills also for you to contribute to the mobility industry. In this uh, visual, what I have shown, tried to show is the walls that exist, like the domains, uh, electrical engineering, electronics engineering, mechanical engineering, computer science engineering, chemical engineering. All these walls exist in a university, in an educational institute, Definitely, because uh, you need that specialization. But when you come to the industry, 
all these walls go away because the products that you'll be bringing, building, will actually cut across multiple engineering domains. So typically, you will get to work in cross-functional teams with all these engineers, a mechanical engineer, an electrical, an electronics engineer, a computer science engineer, a designer, a whole bunch of people working together. So all these walls will go away. The moment you come out of your college and you enter the industry, all these walls will be broken. So you need to kind of uh, mentally prepare yourself for thinking beyond your domain. This is a very important uh, preparation that you would need when you come from university to the industry. The future mobility industry is looking at your profile closer to what you would call as a universal engineer. In the sense, if you are talking about electrified, connected, autonomous, and shared mobility, if you want to build such a vehicle, you need to have certain skills which are beyond individual engineering disciplines. For example, a pure mechanical engineer profile may not be sufficient. You may want to look at a mixture of mechanical and electronics or mechanical and software. So a mechanical engineer with basic programming skills. These kind of combinations you will start looking when you want to build vehicles which are electric, autonomous, connected, and shared. So this is obvious. This is quite understandable. So a mechanical engineer, for example, must have a robust knowledge of electrical and electronic systems to lead detailed discussions with their counterparts because they'll be working in cross-functional teams. The same is true of electrical or electronic engineer. They have to have this cross-domain engineering knowledge for them to be effective. So here is a visual that I had prepared for one of my uh, recent columns in the Society of Automotive Engineers, Mobility Engineering uh, Magazine. This um, where I had shown various future skills that mobility engineers would need. And here I have trying to summarize what we spoke in the last few minutes. So the first layer, the ground layer is your engineering expertise. Here, we see three engineering domains coming in, rather four, electrical and electronics, mechanical and computer science. What this means is, if you are any one of these engineers, say a mechanical engineer, you need to acquire skills also from the other two domains, electrical and electronics, and also computer science. The same way, a person with electrical electronics background may have to pick up some skills in mechanical engineering and computer science domains. So that's a foundation layer, which is engineering expertise. You need to have a mix of all these three engineering domain knowledge. The next layer is what we call as integration, where you're applying this knowledge and bringing together multiple subsystems to build a vehicle. So the integration layer, you look at the key skills as quality management, systems management, communication, and most importantly, customer orientation. These four skills, what we refer to as integration skills, is what will help you to apply your knowledge and build products for the future. And most importantly, the top layer, if you look at this layer, what we call as growth. The first layer is expertise. The second layer is integration. And the third layer is growth. This is how do you have a growth mindset? What kind of an attitude and approach will accelerate your growth in the industry? These are three main things that we'll talk about. Having an innovative mindset, having the right ethics, and ability to manage risk. And finally, learnability. Your ability to learn new technologies, new skills as they come. Because in the future, there are going to be a lot of new things that will be entering our industry. So your ability to quickly learn all these new things becomes very important. So we are looking at the foundation layer of engineering expertise, the middle layer of integration skills, and the top layer of having a growth mindset. This is what define the future skills that we will all need to be successful in the mobility industry. This is just a summary of what I spoke the last few minutes. 
and uh, where would you get these skills? So you would get some of these skills from the university and some of these skills from the industry. Okay. So if you see what I have circled in purple color, these are the skills that you can pick up when you are still in your college. The other box, which is golden yellow color, those are the ones you'll pick up when you come to the industry. And of course, there is a overlap area, which is skills that you would pick up both in your college and also in the industry. Okay. This is how it is typically structured. So when you are in the college, if you want to become industry ready, you need to get some industry exposure. You need to do some internships in the industry and get mentored by experts from the industry. These are very important. Same day, when you are in the industry, you need to constantly go back to the university and use the experts available in the academia to learn newer technologies, continuously upgrade your knowledge, your competencies and skills. So it's a continuous learning. It's not that you pass out of the college and then get into the industry and then your learning stops. Your learning is lifelong. So quite often you may have to go back and say do a master's or go back and do a PhD or just go back for a short term and learn some new skills and come back. So this is becomes very essential because so many new skills we need to acquire through our entire career. So some of it will come through your industry exposure and some of it you may have to go back to your college, to your university to acquire these skills. So that's how I see that there is a need for us to continuously learn and we need to plan this learning so that it happens and it gets prioritized over many other things. So this discipline of having a plan and continuously learning becomes very critical for our success. So in this uh, few minutes, what I have covered is one of the two important skills that we need for the future, which is the domain skills. Now I would like to talk about the cognitive skills. By cognitive skills, I'm basically going to tell you about five thinking skills that will help us to be super effective, that will help us to be very, very successful in the future mobility space. And very quickly, I will take you through what are those thinking skills. The very first thinking skill would be what I refer to as design thinking. This is uh, every engineer needs to learn and practice this design thinking skill. It's very, very important. So some of you may already be aware and might have undergone training in design thinking. For those of you for whom it is a bit new, I'll just spend a minute to tell you what I have in mind when I talk about design thinking. So what you see on my slide here, this beautiful colorful thing is actually a MRI mission. A MRI mission in a hospital, which looks like this. And there is a story around this, which was one of the first very early experiments in design thinking. Uh, the inventor of the MRI machine, once when he had to go to a hospital and see how the patients are being scanned in MRI, he found that in that case, in particular case, it was a pediatric ward and it was a small child who was a patient. And then he found that this patient has to be strapped to this um, and then they can't move for maybe 30, 40 minutes. And it's, uh, it's a very dark tunnel into which the whole thing slides. So it's a very scary and uncomfortable experience if somebody wants to get an MRI scan done. So that made him think as to how can I make this a uh, pleasant and enjoyable experience for the end user? So he thought hard. He was an engineer and he has built the MRI machine. But he went beyond engineering to look at how can I design this MRI machine in such a way that it's a great experience for this young child who's getting an MRI scan done. Then he derived inspiration from the theme parks like the Disneyland and other entertainment parks. He said, can I create visuals and audio to give the experience of 
the child getting into, say, uh, finding Nemo kind of an underwater experience or some kind of a pirate ship and some adventure experience. Like the this, he started thinking to say, how can I convert this MRI mission into something very interesting and enjoyable for the end user? This example is very often talked in the context of design thinking because MRI mission is a high-tech mission and it is uh, already doing its job of uh, imaging and diagnosing. What is the need for all these uh, fancy things in MRI mission? One may wonder. But the need is, what will be the product? Be it be a car or a MRI mission, at the end of the day, it should give a pleasant, enjoyable experience for the end user. If that is not happening, then there is something missing. There's a huge opportunity for improvement. Whatever be the product, whether it's an MRI mission or a car or a pen or a book, whatever it is, it has to give a great experience for the end user. So design thinking is all about our ability as an engineer to empathize with the person who is going to use the product. We call this as a human-centered design, where we keep the human at the center of the entire design process and then engineer a product that will address the needs of this human being. This is design thinking. And design thinking has five important phases. Empathize, which is looking at the customers and understand what they need. And then define, which is defining the right engineering problems that we need to solve. Ideate, which is coming up with the innovative solutions. Prototype, which is very important, which is building prototypes of these early stage ideas and seeing what works, what doesn't work, and using it to iteratively improve the idea itself. Finally, test. And uh, quickly testing and validating to see whether this is what we want to do. But in a more uh, deeper sense, what design thinking does, it brings the emotion, the heart, the analytical power of the brain together so that the end product is addressing the deep needs of the customer both the rational needs of the customer and also the emotional needs of the customer. That's what design thinking is all about. So as an engineer, when you apply design thinking, then you're looking at a bunch of ideas for a new product. Typically, you would ask, is this something that the customer would desire? Is it technically feasible? And finally, is it economically viable? In the sense, will it make a profit at the end of the day? So human-centered design is basically at the interface of these three very important criteria of desirability, feasibility, and viability. So each one of us, whatever be the branch we are specializing in, we have to learn and practice design thinking if you want to build products that will have a positive impact on the lives of people. This is very, very important for all of us. Having talked about design thinking, the second skill that I want to introduce to you is exponential thinking. So to explain exponential thinking to you, I'm going to tell you a story. So this is a story. It's a infinitely sweet story. Okay. So I'll tell you why it is so. Um, this is a story that happened uh, many, many, many years back, as most stories do, in a part of uh, Kerala. Here, there is a king, and this king was um, very, very um, passionate about playing chess. He used to spend a lot of his time playing chess with uh, different people who visit his court. And the legend has it that once God himself comes as an aged wise person to his court and says, I want to play chess with you. And... Um, the king says, yes, we can play. I'd be most happy to play chess with you. The wise old man says, there is a condition that if I win the game, you have to give me whatever I demand. The king says, okay, tell me what is it that you want if you win the game. And this wise old man says, I want one grain of rice for the first square of the chess board. Two for the second, four, eight, 16, 32, 64, 
2048, and so on. So every square, you have to double the number of grains of rice that you give me. The king uh, did a quick math and thought, okay, there are only 64 squares in the chessboard. And he's asking only for grains of rice, not bags of rice. He's just doubling the grains of rice. So it may not add up to a lot, maybe 10 bags of rice. Even if it is 100 bags of rice, no problem, I can give him. But let us play the game. Yeah, I need to worry only if he wins a game. Let us see. Okay, so they start playing the game. And um, as you would have predicted, the wise old man, who is God himself, who has come down, he wins the game. So now the king has to give the rice that the man had demanded. And he started counting and giving. And uh, to your surprise, you'll find that this is not a small number, which the king thought, but it's a unimaginably big number. I have shown you the calculation here. So if you follow the calculation, you will realize that it's a multi-digit, really, really big number. To, for you to get a sense for how big the number is. If you keep doubling, one, two, four, eight, like that, finally you will end up at uh, two power 64 minus one, which is this large number of grains, and uh, which is so many metric tons. To get a feel for this, how much rice this is, this is more than 2,000 times the global production of rice in 2014. So even today, if you want to give the reward that God had asked the king, if you take all the rice grown across the globe, it will take us 2,000 years to collect enough rice that God had demanded. So no king can ever give the reward that he had asked for. So the legend has it that this, because the king could not do that, actually he had made a rule that in that particular temple in Kerala, whoever visits at any time of the day, whenever in the year, they will always be served this uh, sweet payasam which is made out of rice. It's a rice payasam that is always served. So to, actually this happens. Still today it's been happening in this particular temple that whenever you go, you'll always get this particular prasadam. And this is a story behind it, the story of exponentially growing numbers. Very, very interesting. And um, this story, I have seen um, versions of this in many other regions. Uh, instead of rice in some other culture, it is wheat and so on. But this story is shown to explain the exponential rate at which numbers grow when you start doubling. And you may wonder why I'm telling you this story and I'm talking about rice when we are actually supposed to talk about technology and automotive, the future automotive technology. What is the connection? Friends, this exponential growth is also been happening in some of the technologies that we'll be using in our cars. One of which is the exponential rise in the computational power. Those of you who have background in electronics and semiconductors would be familiar with what I show here, which is the Moore's law. Moore, Gordon Moore predicted in um, early 1970, that the power of computation would double every 18 months, and the cost of computing would also half every 18 months. And here is a plot that I've shown you how the processor power has improved over the years. Here you would see that the y-axis is actually a log scale. That's why I'm able to show it all in one screen, but the growth has been phenomenal. This doubling has happened for more than 30 years, 1970 to 2000 is the data that you see here. There is a continuous doubling every 18 months. So when computation doubles every one and a half years, the cost of computation also becomes half. I can imagine when you bring that powerful technology into your vehicle, when you're talking about autonomous vehicle, which is powered by this exponentially growing computational power, then you can imagine how the performance of such a product would grow exponentially, and how much the value that is being created for the customer would also grow exponentially under these conditions. So it is not just the computation power. Here I want to show you 
at least 12 such disruptive technologies which are growing exponentially. I am sure you are familiar with most of these technologies. What is important is when these technologies converge in a future vehicle, then you can see that the power of these technologies coming together is going to be very, very unimaginably large and quite disruptive in nature too. So it's very important for us to leverage the power of all these technologies when you are building your future automotive product. This is uh, just an example of convergence of such technologies in a vehicle. This uh, vehicle, which is called Oli, Oli is a eight-seater vehicle, and uh, this is uh, 3D printed using advanced materials, lightweighting materials, and this is electric. It's a connected vehicle, and most interestingly, this is an autonomous vehicle but doesn't have any onboard intelligence as such, just has a few basic sensors and cameras. But the intelligence is residing on the cloud. It's basically powered by IBM Watson sitting on the cloud. So this vehicle is a connected vehicle. So through IoT, it sends the data across to IBM Watson on the cloud. And with this arrangement, uh, the IBM Watson is able to guide this vehicle to accelerate or brake or move left or move right. So in a dense traffic, typical of most of our cities, this vehicle can navigate through. And uh, this vehicle has been on the road for a few years, and now we have sufficient data from vehicles like this to look at how we can further enhance the performance of products at the convergence of multiple technologies like this. So this is the future. When you talk about future mobility products, basically we are looking at the power that we can bring by the convergence of multiple technologies, each of which is growing exponentially. That's a great opportunity that we have before us. Having talked about the design thinking and exponential thinking, just want to spend a few minutes on sustainable thinking. December 2019, if you had looked at New Delhi, you wouldn't have seen much. There was a heavy smog and um, things were not so visible. But just a few months after that, in April 2020, somebody in Jalandhar took a photograph and the air quality was so great, it was so clear that they could see the Himalayan peaks in the background. So if we just, we stayed at home for a few weeks in March and April. And in this short time, nature is able to heal itself. So do we really need a health crisis like COVID to teach us the simple fact? Can we not really keep it that way, that even after this COVID crisis has passed, we are able to keep our environment clean and healthy? So how do we use innovation and technology to develop products that are sustainable and also build businesses that are sustainable? This is important for every innovator to consider when they are coming up with new technologies and new products making sure that what they do is sustainable has a positive impact on the environment. The last two skills I want to introduce to you today, one is innovative thinking, the other is rational thinking. So let me tell you, let me share with you a couple of tools on innovative thinking. So to come up with innovative ideas, you need to have lots and lots of ideas because some ideas will be really good, some of them so-so, and many of them will be really lousy. So to start with, you need to have lots of ideas if you want to have a few innovative ideas. So from that perspective, I thought I will introduce one tool for you, which is a divergent thinking tool. And uh, this tool, I call it the noun and the verb. I show you here four quadrants, and they are titled same noun and same verb, same noun and different verb, and so on. So let me explain to you what I mean by this. Suppose you take a, say a pen. A pen is a noun and the verb is to write. So, but whenever you think of a pen, you think of writing. These, the noun and the verb are so strongly coupled. Now, if we move to the second square, which is a green one, it says same noun and different verb. By this, what I mean is, can you find new applications for the pen other than writing 
what else can you do with a pen typically if you try to see what all i use the pen for other than writing what can i do maybe i can use it as a paper weight i can uh, use it to point to somebody i can use it to make some sound i can use it to maybe comb my hair i can use a pen other than writing i'm sure i can think of at least 20 or 30 different other uses for which i can put this pen if you move diagonally across to the yellow block it says a different noun and the same verb by this what i mean is i want to write but other than a pen what else can i use to write here i can think of maybe a pencil or a chalk or a piece of charcoal or a brick or if there is a layer of dirt i can even write with my finger variety of things i can think of if i have to write but if i don't have a pen finally the last block which is the orange one this is a different noun and a different verb what this what i mean is it's not a pen you cannot write but still you need to communicate so how do you do how do you communicate without writing and without using a pen okay fine i can speak i can make a video i can draw something i can show you i can just mime and enact it so many things i can think of that i won't use a pen that i won't write but still i'll be able to get the message across so whenever you are looking at any problem to solve and you want to come up with a better solution a better product systematically you can go through all these four blocks to generate as many ideas as possible by changing the noun or the verb and finally changing both that way you will be able to come up with many many disruptive ways in which you'll be able to come up with a better product or a better solution this is a fun way and a very easy way to come up with lots of ideas this is a noun and the verb which is a divergent thinking tool I'll just take a minute to introduce one more tool to you, which personally I find it very entertaining and very very effective when it comes to new ideas. This uh, tool I call it as adaptive thinking. So if I'm trying to solve a problem, um, say I, let me take a problem like how can I improve the efficiency, the fuel efficiency of a car, or uh, how can I uh, manage to drive through a dense traffic in the city. these are problems i'm sure many of us would like to solve that time typically what i would do when i'm using adaptive thinking tool is instead of trying to think like shankar i'd like to think like many other people i'd ask how would steve jobs solve this problem how would steve jobs solve this problem of improving the fuel efficiency or navigating through dense traffic think about it what would sherlock holmes do sure you know sherlock holmes is good at observing and finding things which most other people miss so if sherlock holmes is trying to solve this problem maybe i'll try to go a little deeper and understand what is causing the traffic jams what is causing the energy losses like that i will try to probe and go a little deeper and think like sherlock to connect things make some observations and then plan my strategy then i would ask what would superman do or what would endiran do everything suddenly when you talk about superman or endiran or even think of a child so creative who likes to have fun you are suddenly donning a hat and then you are trying to think like a different person and then you are able to bring a new perspective to the way you look at the problem and the way you come up with ideas this is a very simple i have 100 plus cards like this that i have made for myself so that whenever i run out of ideas i try to ask myself how would say gandhi solve this problem or how would uh, elon musk solve a problem like this or even looking back how would um, bruce lee solve a problem or how would um, kung fu panda solve this problem how would uh, tom and jerry solve a problem like this i look at lot of fun characters that i like i'm familiar with to see if they have to solve this particular technical problem how would they go about what kind of ideas they would come up with 
So this uh, tool is called adaptive thinking tool. Just one more I wanted to introduce is a reverse thinking tool. Uh, this is uh, typically, um, suppose you want to come up with an innovative idea for designing a school. So typically when you think of a school, you'll imagine that a school should have a teacher, it should have a building, it should have exams and students. And when I'm trying to do reverse thinking, what I do is I reverse each of this. How will I run a school if I don't have a teacher? How will I run a school if I don't have a building? How will I run my school if I cannot conduct exams? Or how will I run my school if no students turn up? So one at a time, if you look at it, if you see the pictures that I've shown, um, people, somebody didn't have a building, so they ran the school under the shade of a tree. And somewhere uh, they had a school which was on a boat. So this boat could actually move from place to place. And it's a lot of fun. And a place where they didn't have a teacher on a particular day, the senior students taught the junior students. And then students bunched together, started discussing and learning from each other. Then a bunch of kids were seeing some videos and then learning from those videos. And then there is a robot which was used to entertain the kids and teach them something. So there are a lot of options when you try to reverse each of these assumptions and ask, how can I make this work even when this particular resource is not there? So you take all these ideas and put it back in the original system, which could be a school with the teachers, building, exams, and students. But when you add this, all these reverse thinking ideas, becomes very, very innovative and it's a lot of fun. People really like it. So this is uh, what is called as reverse thinking, a very, very powerful innovative thinking tool that I wanted to share with you today. So we talked about uh, design thinking, exponential thinking, sustainable thinking, innovative thinking. So let me just take a couple of minutes to introduce the final one, which is rational thinking. So I'm going to give you two examples to illustrate to you what I mean by rational thinking. The first one is this is all about understanding what kind of biases we have in our mind, and how we can overcome the bias so that we think right. Okay. The first example I'll give you is you have gone for a movie and it was supposed to be a good movie, but it turns out to be very, very boring. So would you leave the movie in the middle, go out and do something else? Or you will sit through the movie. Very simple question. Okay. We were supposed to be interesting, but you find it very boring. Whether you will get up and go out or you will continue to see the movie. This is a question. And guess what? Your action, either to stay there or get up and go, will depend on something very interesting. Your friend has given you the ticket to the movie. So you have not paid for it. Okay. He had bought the ticket. He could not go. He's given to you. If this is a situation that you have not spent the money, somebody has spent the money, then you may not mind getting up and going away. But suppose you had spent money and bought the ticket, then you may not want to get up and go away. You may sit through and see, even though it's a boring movie, you may sit through and see it till the end. It may or may not be true for you, but this is one kind of a cognitive bias that many of us suffer from, and it's called sunk cost bias. In the sense, if we have put our money to something, into something, if we already invested, we tend to hold on to it for a longer time. Sometimes this may do good, many times it may do bad for you, but this is a bias that you should be aware of and ask yourself, do I have this bias? Is this bias actually interrupting in my decision making. Okay. This is very important. Okay. Um, there are many such biases, but today I will just introduce only two such bias to you. Second is what is called a framing effect bias. Here the example I want to give you is there is a aged relative of yours, about 65 year old, and she is suffering from some serious health condition. It makes her life very miserable, very difficult, but does not pose an immediate risk to her life. She is managing fine. So now she can go through a surgery. And if that surgery is successful, it will cure her totally. 
however operation is slightly risky the surgeon the doctor tells you that 30% of the patients undergoing the operation they die on hearing this would you still recommend that she undergoes the operation this is the scenario now i'll try slide to restate the scenario because you have gone to some other doctor instead of this doctor and that doctor says 70% of the patients undergoing this operation will survive okay so he is telling very confidently very positively that 70% of the patients undergoing this operation will survive so would you recommend that this relative of yours undergoes this operation look at the numbers the first doctor said 30% will die and the second doctor said 70% will survive it's the same but many people may go for the operation when they hear this positive comment that 70% will survive and many people may decide not to go for the operation if they hear this negative comment that 30% of the patients undergoing the operation will die this is called a framing effect bias in the sense the way it is framed it can bias the mind towards making a decision one way or the other and um, many of us do have this bias and the way is being framed can have a very strong influence on our ability to think and make the decision and um, there are many such cognitive biases that we need to be aware of and a good place to read and understand about this is the work of the nobel laureate daniel kahneman who spent um, a good part of his life researching on this cognitive biases and one of the books that i personally liked is thinking fast and slow and uh, this is a very uh, readable book to get started but what i want to say is there are many such cognitive biases even if you are the most innovative mind even if you are the best engineer some of these cognitive biases can make us make a wrong decision so we need to be aware of this so in this few minutes friends what i shared with you is uh, five important thinking skills design thinking exponential thinking sustainable thinking innovative thinking and rational thinking so with this we have covered the domain skills and also the cognitive skills that we need as a future mobility engineer so i want to wrap up my session with a few questions that you could consider answering as a assessment for this particular session what are the four disruptions that are shaping the future of mobility what are the three domains in which every mobility engineer needs to build engineering expertise in what are the four integration skills that mobility engineers need to build what are the three elements of a growth mindset for a mobility engineer and finally what are the five cognitive skills that are desirable for mobility engineers of the future please uh, try answering these uh, five questions and you could share your responses with the uh, npetel or directly with me this will help us to assess how useful this session was for you so today we talked about both the domain skills and the cognitive skills that would be important for future mobility engineers and i also did a recent session just about a week back answering lot of questions from a whole wide variety of questions from audience like you and uh, the video of this is available i have provided the link here and some of them are very interesting questions and i have answered them to the best of my ability so i'd encourage you to also look at this video to get some of your questions answered uh, this was all about the skills and the disciplines for the future mobility and the road to get there that was the theme of that uh, q and a session that i held about a week back so with this i wanted to thank npetel for uh, hosting my talk on future skills for mobility engineers and i would like to stay with in touch with all of you you could follow me on my blog called innovation flow and also i have provided my email address for your contact and uh, with this i want to unshare my screen so that i can look at the questions that you want me to answer and uh, we have already crossed the time it is already 7 now but i will let me see if i can take a few questions and then answer you in the session itself 
the rest of it i will respond by email with you okay so give me a moment when i open and look at the questions that you have posted for some reasons i am unable to access the google sheet so i'll sort it out figure out a way to look at the questions that uh, you have posted for me and i will uh, get back to you with my response to all your questions but uh, till that happens i would like to uh, i would encourage you to look at the video which i had shared on the last slide that i had uh, answered many such questions that's uh, just about a week back so you start with that and meanwhile i'll get access to the questions that you have posted and I respond to all those questions by email sure so with this i would like to thank npitel for uh, hosting my talk today i'd like to thank each one of you for your interest in attending the session and seriously start preparing yourself for a uh, future of uh, mobility and i'm sure each one of you aspire to become a mobility engineer and uh, i'll be most happy to help you in this journey to help you acquire the right skills and hone them as you get ready for the future mobility industry so thank you so much have a great weekend ahead see you bye